Let's take a moment to consider the tools used in the world of data science. You'll notice that each tool has evolved for a specific purpose, and also that a number of these tools are shared with the world of business intelligence. So again, let's use the data science process to see where these tools fit in. First, we have ETL and data transformation tools, mostly SQL. SQL is used to extract data from databases, and it allows us to query, filter, and transform our data. Next, we have coding for data analysis. And for this, we typically are using Python or R. These are the two most widely used coding languages in data science. Python tends to be favored as a more generally applicable coding language, but R is popular for those focused on statistical analyses. Data visualization tools such as Tableau, Power BI, and many others are used to visualize model outputs with clear and engaging charts. They're helpful to simplify complex analyses into clear stories and outcomes that drive decision making. Now, obviously, if the outcomes of a project are fairly simple, you wouldn't necessarily need to go into a data visualization tool. You may do that natively in Python or whatever other app or website is being used to render the results of your analysis. And finally, we have the software and data engineering tools. For this, again, we could use Python, but we also have other tools like Scala, Hadoop, Databricks, and so on. And so these are the tools that allow all of these more technical roles to turn analysis into apps, websites, and interfaces. The tools allow engineers to connect to real-time data feeds that allow businesses then to see predictive analysis in real time or to implement automated decision making. So as you can see, it is true that data science is far more coding heavy than business intelligence. And these are the key tools that will help you get there. Now that we've done tools, let's look at the roles in data science. Data science roles can be highly specialized or they might be very general. So with that in mind, it's always important to read the job description to see exactly what the company is after. Again, let's map the roles onto the same data science process. And since we're talking data science, let's start with the data scientists. Data scientists are more focused on the coding for the actual analyses. They're proficient in advanced statistical methods, which is used to create analysis and predictions from data. Their coding, as we said, tends to focus on analyzing the data itself. Next up, we have a machine learning engineer. And the difference here is that the coding they're doing is more focused on software and data engineering. They're integrating the analysis and predictive models into real world systems, apps, or websites. They're linking models with automated data feeds, and they'll probably know several coding languages and have a highly technical skill set. Next up, we have the data analyst which is still focusing on the analysis that we're all familiar with, but in a less technical sense than maybe a data scientist. They're sourcing data, creating formulas and data models. They understand the business well, and they're searching for insights in data. And they may be working closely with the data scientist. A data visualization specialist might work with either of these roles to turn their insights into meaningful visuals. And for this, their communication skills are essential. Now, before any of this analysis is done, we have to think about where exactly this data comes from, who designs the databases, and the structure of how we capture that data. And that was down to the data architect. So they create the data strategy, which includes how, where, when, and what data is stored. We then need someone to act as a bridge between those databases and data sources and the inputs that we need for our project. And that's where a data engineer or SQL developer comes in. This is one of the more technical roles in BI or data science. The data engineer understands the database and ensures data quality and availability, making sure that analysts and data science have what they need to do their job. Finally, if you see the term database admin or DBA, this role acts as a caretaker or a gatekeeper for a database. They're responsible for security, access, changes, and performance in that system. So in any data science team, you're likely to see a combination of these different roles. I've tried to define them quite neatly into buckets here, but you'll find that the boundaries between each are a little more gray. Like I said, check the job description and make sure you know exactly what the company is after.
So now you know how to define terms like data science and machine learning. But what about artificial intelligence? Isn't that the same thing? Well, not really, though you will often see the terms used interchangeably. Machine learning is the process by which computers learn from data and make inferences or predictions. That's what we've seen so far. Artificial intelligence is when a computer replicates human thinking or abilities. So machine learning really is a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is capable of not only machine learning, but many other tasks. And so artificial intelligence is a much broader subject. Let's take a look at three examples. Autonomous cars are constantly evaluating surroundings based on sensors and data, and they're making decisions and taking actions just like a human would. So that is artificial intelligence. Chatbots are evaluating the message you send into a website. And whilst they might not be perfect just yet, they're starting to reply with useful links or tips just like a human might. So this is artificial intelligence. And finally, something like trading algorithms, which are following statistical rules. And as an outcome, they're buying and selling stocks just like a human would. That is artificial intelligence. So in summary, AI is a term used to describe when a computer behaves like a human. This can be a simple task or a complex one like driving. Regression is one of the most widely used techniques in machine learning. Within the machine learning process, our regression model fits into the model building and model evaluation phase. The goal of regression is to assess the relationship between one or more input variables and a continuous output variable. And we can summarize that relationship with a line of best fit. The line of best fit allows us to make predictions about the value of a target variable in a given scenario. So here we can see we have an ad spend of $27,000. Our previous observations give us a line of best fit and we can make a prediction as to what sales we're likely to get from that ad spend. Not all scenarios are so simple though. Sometimes relationships can be linear, like that first example that we saw. But in other scenarios, relationships are more complex. Here we've got an example of a non-linear relationship between the amount of water and the crop yield we get from a farm. Before we go any further, I just want to clarify the various pieces of terminology used within regression. So when we talk about model inputs, there are various terms that might be used. In general, these are predictor variables, and we might call them inputs, independent variables, explanatory variables, or we might just refer to them by x or x1, 2, 3 if there's more than one. On the other side, our target variable can also be known as an output, a dependent variable, a response variable, or simply just referred to as y. But in summary, the goal of regression is to understand how those predictor variables can help us predict the target variable. Simple linear regression is the simplest form of regression analysis. So we have one input variable x and the target variable y. And as with any straight line, we can give it an equation in the form of y equals mx plus c. y is the target variable we're trying to predict. x is the input variable. m is the coefficient m is the coefficient value or slope, which means it's the amount by which y changes for every change in x. It tells us how steep the line is. And finally, the line doesn't always go through the origin, so c represents the intercept. It's sometimes helpful to think of the intercept as what would the likely value of y be if x were zero? But that doesn't always hold true, so be careful with that one. More generally, it just represents that intersection point on the y-axis. If we have a positive slope coefficient greater than 1, this suggests a strong positive relationship between the input and target variables. A unit increase in x drives a more than one unit increase in y. In the second example, a change in x drives only a small change in y, so the slope coefficient is smaller. Likewise, a negative slope coefficient suggests a negative relationship between the input and target. 
In summary, the linear regression line of best fit can be summarized by a straight line equation. The parameters that define the line are called coefficients, and these help us understand the interaction between input and output variables. One input variable is rarely enough to make good predictions about a target variable. And so with that in mind, we can explore multiple linear regression, which allows us to predict a target variable using multiple independent variables. Suppose we now use two explanatory variables to try and explain our target. It becomes a little bit more difficult to visualize our data points and line of best fit, but we can still achieve it, this time using a plane through a 3D field. The plane can be summarized by an equation, this time with one additional parameter. Now x1 and x2 both have their own coefficients, which define how those variables affect the output, y. Again, we still have an element of random error around our plane. Our plane isn't perfect, but it's a good generalization of the relationships between all these points. So in summary, multiple linear regression helps us predict a target variable using more than one input.